On this week in Enterprise Tech, you ever wonder what could happen if internet service became a utility? Well, we'll discuss it. What about that app you can't stop using, but you find out it might have been abandoned by its developer? What do you think? Security risk? Well, Curtis takes us through that. Plus, we have a great guest, Joe Garber, Global Head Strategy and Solutions for Microfocus. He takes us through digital transformations and what organizations can do to stay ahead of that curve. Shouldn't miss it. Twine on the set. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you from LastPass Studio. Stay in control when it comes to your company's access points and authentication. LastPass makes enterprise-level security simple for your remote workforce. Check out lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. twit. This is Twyatt, This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 395, recorded May 29th, 2020. Digital transformation for an analog world. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by ExtraHop. ExtraHop helps you keep your business secure and available with SaaS-based cloud native network detection and response. Get tips on securing and supporting remote access or check out the full product demo at extrahop.com slash enterprise. And by Barracuda. Did you know that 91% of all cyber attacks start with an email? To uncover the threats hiding in your Office 365 account, get a secure and free email threat scan at barracuda.com slash enterprise. Welcome to Twyatt, this week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I'm your host, Louis Moreski, your guide through this big, giant world of the enterprise. But I definitely can't guide you by myself. I need to bring in the professionals, the experts in their field, starting with our very own geek in paradise, Mr. Brian Chi. Cheever, great to see you back, man. What's, what's going on this week for you? I've been working on fixing surveillance cameras and emergency call boxes to make the campus a safer place for my nieces. Fantastic, fantastic. Now, how many how many cameras are you up to now? Um, I've actually lost count. There are a crap, <laughs> a, a lot of cameras, <laughs> and um, part of the, part of the issue is trying to integrate it all and set up rules and you know, motion detect and all that stuff and make sure that, you know, when things happen, it pops up for the uh, 24 by 7 monitoring consoles. All right. Makes sense. Makes sense. Well, thanks for being here. Well, speaking of experts, we have our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin. He's the senior editor over there at Dark Reading. Curtis, I don't think uh, the, uh, the, the vulnerabilities and uh, hackers were sleeping this week, were they? No, no, they've been using the pandemic to uh, effectively work from home or self-isolation or wherever they're working from. <laughs> uh, they're still out there doing their thing. Uh, the black hats, the white hats, the gray hats, lots going on in cybersecurity. And, um, well, I'm glad because it keeps me employed for another week. <laughs> That it does, that it does. Well, speaking of enterprise news, we've definitely had a busy week um, and a lot of security news as well. So let's get to it. Now, ever wonder what could happen if internet service could become a utility? Well, what's the worst could happen there? Well, we'll, we'll get into that. Do you ever wonder if uh, an app that you use a ton hasn't been updated in a while, maybe abandoned? What happens to those apps? What happens to you? Maybe, maybe vulnerabilities there? We'll talk about that. Organizations are always looking for ways to digitally transform, making that easier for them. Well, we have Joe Garber, Global Head Strategy and Solutions for Microfocus, and he's here to take us through that and how maybe organizations can make it easier to digitally transform. But before we get into all that, we have to get into this week's blips. Now, it wouldn't be an enterprise week without a leak. And this week, we have hackers targeting a university with ransomware. Now, this past week, Michigan, Michigan, Michigan State University received a deadline to pay ransomware attackers under the threat that the files would be stolen from their institution's network and will be leaked to the public. Now, a countdown timer on the attacker's website shows that the university has about six days to comply or secret data, quote unquote, will become public. Now, the site set up 
by NetWalker ransomware gang gives no details about the attack, but they posted images with directories, a passport scan, and two financial documents allegedly stolen from the university's network. Now, NetWalker ransomware relies on multiple programs for remote access like TeamViewer, AnyDesk files from public code repositories and custom PowerShell scripts. However, they also use at least three legitimate tools to uninstall security software on a compromised system. Now, researchers at Sophos Security Software and Hardware Company shared in a report yesterday that the threat actor also used legitimate removal tools from ESET antivirus, Trend Micro Security Agent, and Microsoft Security Client that is part of the Microsoft Security Essentials package. Now, they also found individual samples of the Zeppelin Windows ransomware and the Smog, uh, Smog Linux r- ransomware as well. Now, one of them is the CVE-2020-0796, for which there is a proof-of-concept exploit code released for a local privilege escalation. Now, it can be also exploited for remote code execution, but the code for this is not currently available to the public. Now, NetWalker Ransomware Group advertised recently that they were looking for new collaboration with access to large enterprise networks. Now, the move is meant to distance themselves from malware distribution through spam, which is their common method. Now, it's an, as an incentive, the group promised affiliates huge rewards, like actually a cut between 80 to 84 percent of a payout. Now, our other ransomware operators typically offer only about 70 percent uh, for the ransom money. Money. Now, as we've talked about before, these ransomware networks are growing, and more contract for higher models are being followed, making it harder to track the real groups that are doing the attacks. As always, this just reminds us our organization should be stay up to date on the latest patches and make sure we keep backups as critical systems. Well, a GitHub supply chain attack is using the Octopus scanner malware. Back on March 9th, the GitHub Security Incident Response Team, or CERT, received a message from security researcher JJ, who had discovered a set of GitHub repositories actively serving malware. A deep dive analysis of the malware revealed it was built to compromise NetBeans projects, something that they hadn't seen before on GitHub. All affected projects were actively serving backdoored code, and the owners of these repositories were completely unaware. Once the GitHub security team learned the command and control server wasn't active, they were able to reduce the risk level and take a closer look at Octopus Scanner, which is an open source supply chain malware. The unique feature around this malware is that it's targeting developers as a means of spreading the security team explained. Once the computer gets infected, it looks for NetBean files to infect. When Octopus Scanner lands on a machine, it looks for signs indicating the NetBean's IDE is in use on a developer system, and if it is, Octopus Scanner ensures that every time a project is built, any resulting jar files are infected with a dropper. When executed, the payload ensures persistence and spreads a remote access Trojan, or RAT. For developers, the challenge is knowing their dependencies, knowing when they need to be patched. For open source maintainers, challenges in preventing issues and responding as quickly as possible whenever it's necessary. Well, SpaceX and the U.S. Army signed a deal to test Starlink broadband for military use. The U.S. Army has signed a three-year deal with SpaceX to test the company's Starlink satellite broadband service, according to Space News Today. On May 20th, the Army and SpaceX signed a cooperative research and development agreement called CRADA. An Army sole source told the organization this will allow the Army to use Starlink broadband in order to determine whether it should be rolled out for wider use. CRADAs are commonly used by the military to evaluate technologies and services from the private sector before it commits to buying them, according to Space News. The Army, in this case, wants to be able to assess the performance of the Starlink Low Earth Orbit Internet Service when connected to military systems. The Army will seek answers to key questions such as what ground equipment it will need to use Starlink and how much systems integration work could be required. Keep in mind, Akrata was used also for Iridium and before that in Marsat. So this is not a new um, project. Uh, 
So anyway, this is yet another step in the never-ending search to increase communications in the battlefield. One of my original research projects was with DARPA, and it was called Sensit, that sought to provide self-healing, self-organizing mesh networks to extend sensors into the battlefield. This next step would bring unparalleled levels of information for the warfighter, but also unparalleled attack surfaces. Now, we all depend on email for our daily communication. I do, so especially. Sometimes you have to use it on the go, and it's convenient to use the clients that are integrated with the mobile device that you use. They should be more secure, shouldn't they? Well, when those clients have security flaws, it could be devastating. Unfortunately, iOS Mail is in the news again. A cybersecurity agency in Germany has issued a warning urging all iOS users to install Apple's latest security updates, which patch two zero-click security vulnerabilities that impact the company's default email app. Now, the interesting thing in these flaws was they were found years back in the US and were being actively exploited in attacks targeting iOS users since at least January of 2018. Now, Apple has acknowledged the security flaws, though the company says it has found, quote, no evidence they were used against customers. Apple has released security updates with iOS 12, iOS 13.5, and iOS 13.5 beyond that. That fix the vulnerabilities for all affected iOS versions. Now, due to the criticality of the vulnerabilities, the BSI recommends that the respective security update be installed on all effective systems immediately. Now, both of the security flaws affecting Apple's Mail app are no-click vulnerabilities, which result from a memory consumption issue, and they can be triggered after the app processes a malicious uh, crafted message. Now, the first, phone, first vulnerability tracked as CVE 2020-9819 could lead to heat corruption, while the second one, tracked as 9818, may lead to unexpected memory modification or application termination. Fortunately, Apple has addressed flaws for the release of both iOS 13.5 for iPad iOS uh, 13.5 as well, which offer improved memory handling and bounds checking. Now, the vulnerabilities affected uh, for iOS 6S, iPhone 6S, and later iPad Air 2, and later iPad Mini 4, and later, and the iPad Touch 7th generation, according to the iOS security release notes. While high-profile targets are the most at risk here, it's still highly recommended that all iOS users install Apple's latest security updates to avoid falling victim to any potential attacks that exploit the two vulnerabilities. Researchers have ID'd a hacktivist who defaced nearly 5,000 websites. A politically motivated hacktivist who since 2013 defaced nearly 5,000 websites in 40-plus countries has been tripped up by a series of operational security mistakes he made during his seven-year hacking spree. Security researchers at Checkpoint Software, who were commissioned by a foreign government to hunt down the hacker, this week identified him as a 20-something individual living in the municipality of Ubalandia in Brazil. The hacker, who used the handle Vandal the God, defaced websites belonging to governments in Brazil, Argentina, Thailand, Vietnam, and dozens of other countries. Over the last year, though, a majority of his targets, 57%, were U.S.-based and included websites belonging to cities, states, and healthcare organizations. According to Checkpoint, its investigation showed that while anti-government sentiment was a major factor, major driving factor, the hacker was also motivated by other reasons. One of them, try and achieve a personal goal, he had set for himself, of defacing 5,000 websites worldwide. Data from a service that maintains a record of web defacement incidents shows that Vanda the God failed at this, having only defaced some 4,820 sites since 2013. Vanda the God's extensive tweets and his social media activity are what ultimately led to his exposure. The researchers were able to dig up other information from the hacker's public posts on Twitter and Facebook, including photos of his living room from different angles, that allowed them to establish a firm connection between the individual named MR in Brazil and Vanda the God on the web. All right. While I'm Talking about this article, think back. How long has it been since your doctor swabbed the back of your throat um, with a uh, swab to take a sample to send to the lab? Now, while you're thinking about this, here's the article. A fidget spinner 
to detect urinary tract infections. Urinary tract infections have been called the canary in the coal mine of global antibiotic resistance, with more than half of all women having a UTI in their lifetime and men also increasing in susceptibility as they age. UTIs are one of the most common bacterial infections in the world. Because it's not always possible to check for a bacterial infection in a urine sample, patients are often given antibiotics on the basis of symptoms alone, a practice that contributes to the growing resistance of many UTIs to most common treatments. We may be rescued by an unexpected hero, the fidget spinner. In a paper in Nature Biomedical Engineering this week, researchers in South Korea and India describe a new test for UTIs that... <sighs> needs nothing more than a couple of spins by hand of a spinner-like device. Its results, which can be read by anyone, are ready in about an hour. Okay, so not so enterprise IT, but reducing antibiotic-resistant drugs is big business, and you just need to be married to know about UTIs and how much work can be lost to them. Then combine with the ability to help diagnose people in the field, and you have a huge winner, especially for my friends, with a double X chromosome. Now, Tim Brookins is a longtime engineer who has always looked for ways to help the community. Now, when the COVID-19 crisis hit, he jumped into gear and used his engineering prowess to help others by developing a product called Care 19. Now, Care 19 got national recognition recently because it helps users record where they've been over the last 14 days in case they test positive for COVID-19. Now, remembering where you've been in is actually important to the contact tracing process as it enables the tracer to reach out to people who you've made encountered with while, while infected. Well, this past month, Tim got a lesson in crisis management and the media. He was woken up at 3 a.m. to an email telling him that there would be damaging report of his app that day. He had 13 hours to track down the issue and see if it really was an issue or not. Now, imagine if he wasn't actually awake at 3 a.m. there. Now, as a security researcher... Uh, as he researched this more, he found that the security firm that reported the issue actually contacted media before they contacted him. If nothing else, this looked like the privacy and security firm, which will be left unnamed, was looking for more fame than it was to help the vulnerable application developer. Now, what was the flaw that they claimed? Well, the major claim or implication was that they were giving users personal location data to Foursquare for their use. Now, as it turned out, that was unequivocally False. Now, what the app developer did do was it uh, added a couple changes for their code to the app and have it revise this privacy policy to be more transparent. Now, what this has proven is that there are real people behind some of these solutions and applications, and they are trying to do some good. I guess the message we have to security and privacy firms out there, do the right thing, help app developers make the right choices, and actually treat them like people. All the rest will fall into place. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, the bites. But before we get to the bites, we have to thank a really great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that is Extra Hop. Now, the new IT reality is remote access on a massive scale. There's rapid cloud and multi-cloud adoption and a steady increase in Internet of Things devices all on top of the rise of cybercrime. Now, it's more important than ever that organizations can see everything that's going on in their environment from the cloud to data center to customer. But in order to protect and scale your business, you need more than unified visibility. You also need context for detections and intelligence response workflows so teams can collaborate easily and act fast. Extra Hop helps you detect threats and performance issues up to 95% faster and respond 60% more efficiently. Now, ExtraHop helps you keep your business secure and available with SaaS-based cloud-native network detection and response. Now, Wizard of the Coast secures and supports their AWS cloud with ExtraHop. Now, Chief Architect and Information Security Officer Dan McDaniel said, there is no other company that aligns to supporting the DevOps model, the speed, and the lack of friction than ExtraHop. Ulta Beauty uses ExtraHop to secure their Google Cloud as well, to keep network and security teams closely aligned so engineers have more time to focus on innovation. Now, senior IT engineer John Kreese says, before ExtraHop, we were limited visibility into what's going on in the cloud, but now we can quickly identify vulnerabilities and exploits and understand how our applications are performing in the cloud. Take control of your cloud security with ExtraHop. Get tips on securing and supporting remote access or check out the full product demo at extrahop.com slash enterprise. That's extrahop, 
dot com slash enterprise. And we thank Extra Hop for their support of this week, Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's now time for the bites. Now, it's 2020. We all know that. And the coronavirus pandemic has underscored how crucial broadband service is in our American lives for work, entertainment and school. I can definitely tell you I rely on it every day, all day long. And it's just a necessity, and yet it's it's regulated just yet as a utility the way services like water and electricity are. Now, back in 2014 and 2015, there was a really hot debate over whether the Federal Communications Commission should treat broadband service like utility or more precisely as a Title II common carrier service in order to impose net neutrality rules. Ultimately, the FCC did reclassify broadband to enforce net neutrality in 2015, but never imposed strict utility regulations like price caps or network unbundling. Now, broadband users enthusiastically supported the rules and ISPs admitted to investors later that the extra regulations didn't harm their business at all. But the FCC deregulated the broadband industry anyways, eliminating net neutrality rules and other consumer protections such as a prohibition on hidden fees. Now, since that decision, the top ISPs have decreased network investment despite operating in the most regulated free environment they sought. And the FCC has relied on ISPs voluntarily promising instead of real rules to keep customers online during this crucial time. I see some things going on here, guys. I want to throw this to Curtis first. Do we have a bad case deja vu? Did the, didn't the the federal government break up uh, Ma Bell back in the day to introduce competition into the telecom industry? Relatively uh, relatively recent history. Isn't that relatively recent history here? Well, it, it is relatively recent history for some of us. Uh, for others, it uh, is back in the prehistory days. But you're right. Uh, back in the late 70s, early 80s, um, Ma Bell was broken up into the, the RBOX or regional bell operating companies. And later things were changed to allow people to do things like own their own telephones. Um, and the stage was set for, um, alternative long distance carriers like MCI and Sprint to spring up and offer those services. It was said that we would have much cheaper phone service and much better phone service. And the fact is, we have had both of those. I mean, I can remember as a child, if someone called in long distance, all activity stopped because that was a very expensive transaction. Long distance calls were enormously expensive. Today, long distance calls for most of us are some variation on free. Um, And even if we call internationally, It's very, very cheap. The thing is, it took us the better part of 40 years to get there. I think we're seeing some of that now. We're we're seeing the ISPs who got what they want, and instead of immediately doing what they told regulators and legislators they would do, turn around and put the, the additional funds into enhancing their infrastructure, they return them to their shareholders as profits. They're going to do that as long as possible. And the thing is, we will ultimately get higher speed, lower cost bandwidth. It's just going to take us many years and put us in the United States at a competitive disadvantage to the rest of the world when it comes to broadband performance and quality. Right, right. Now, Chiba, you remain, remember back in the day the insane hassle of selling modems during the regular regulated telecom era, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I was um, uh, sale outside sales, inside sales for Universal Data Systems, Codex, and Motorola, and so forth. And back in the days of regulation, um, I actually it was a real, real pain in the butt to sell modems. And the interesting thing is dial-up modems were pathetically slow, and the innovation was glacial. Now, the interesting thing is once deregulation happened, all of a sudden the amount of innovation in the world of modems skyrocketed. So anyway, one of the things I wanted to point out is the – I actually had a round of golf 
with the direct the president of Hawaiian Telephone. Um, originally, I was on a, a board to try and break the monopoly for Hawaiian Telephone in Honolulu, and the it worked out pretty nicely. We got it. We actually broke the monopoly a year before the feds did. I was actually persona non grata with Hawaiian Telephone. I was barred from the building for several years. Many, many, many years later, probably almost a decade, playing that round of golf, the president basically told me, you know, as much as we hated getting, dere you know, hated the monopoly getting broken, we're actually making way more money now than we ever did during the, the monopoly. And that, I think, is the lesson we need to keep in mind. You, we don't want regulation because regulation means lack of imagination for a lot of things. Or it's so hard to get permission to do something that people just give up. Now, this whole deregulation has been great. We've had a lot of innovation and so forth. But we also have people answering to stockholders and trying to pad their um, profit margins to the point where they can get that big IPO or this or that or whatever. We aren't planning. I think it's going, like Kurt said, it's going to take some time for that pendulum to swing and hopefully these carriers are going to start actually investing new services and things like that. I think as consumers, one of the things we need to do is we need to make our voices heard. If your ISP if you think your internet service is not very good, complain and complain in writing. Um, if you are hearing about different things, complain to your legislative body, both your state legislative body and your Congress critters. Because if you do not make your voice heard, the people that actually have the ability to put pressure on these ISPs aren't going to lift a finger. So vote with your dollars and open your mouth and say something. I, I, going back to two, I think it's interesting. The industry is afraid of being made, a, uh, internet being made a utility. In fact, ISPs have pushed back quite a bit. Curtis, I want to throw this to you, last word, before we jump to your bite. Um, what are ISPs afraid of here? Doesn't Title II offer a bunch of perks for them to build out their networks and expand? Well, it can. It really depends on precisely how they think the business is going to go in the future. And let's let's remember something that's happened. If all they want to be is pipes, then, then Title II does offer a great deal. But think about the number of companies out there who started out being a transport mechanism, but who have ultimately gotten into the content business. I think many companies recognize that simple infrastructure is almost inevitably a race to the bottom. It becomes a pure dollars and cents play for your customers. The value add is what they're all looking for. What can we add to this that others can't? And they're worried that in being defined as a utility, they will be limited in what they can add on top of the basic pipes. They look at companies like electric utilities, which are, are def, you know, the uh, definition uh, of a utility company. And in most places, they can provide electricity, but they've had difficulty in various places going much beyond that because of their heavily regulated nature. It depends on what the company thinks the future of their industry is going to look like. And I think in much of these battles, if we look hard, we can see that many of these organizations think that being a simple pipe is not the way they're going to earn most of their money in the future. Thanks, Curtis. We'll see what happens. Let's go ahead and jump into the next bite because this one is actually very interesting to me personally because I have a lot of apps on my iDevice that are actually no longer in the store. I use them all the time because they're useful to me. I'm not going to name names, but there's some really good ones there. I always wonder what happens when these things kind of almost get abandoned. Obviously, does it make my device more insecure? Curtis? Well, interestingly enough, the answer to that question could be a resounding yes. 
I mean, all of us who have been owners of computing devices, whether laptop, desktop, um, handheld phones, tablets, whatever, if you've done that for any length of time, you know that applications, apps, come and go. The app that was so hot this week can be something that the developers have abandoned next week. Software libraries, the things that make up those applications, are in the same boat. The people who maintain them come and go, sometimes because their lives end, sometimes because the organization that was employing them and paying them to maintain the, uh, the library has changed their job, and sometimes just because life intrudes and they get bored and walk away. The software libraries that are no longer being actively developed are a huge problem for programmers and a source of vulnerabilities, and abandoned code bases can also be a huge issue for users. In a report recently published, mobile security firm Wondera argued that many mobile users have applications installed on their smartphones and tablets that are no longer in application development nor offered on the major app stores. The company discovered a significant number of such applications on employees' devices during its regular scanning for security threats. The applications pose security risks, they say, because any vulnerability found in the code will never be patched. The abandoned applications can be on worker devices. They're outdated, not maintained, and those worker devices become enterprise security problems. Now, Productivity applications are the most common as measured by the number of devices that still have an abandoned app installed, according to the report. The original Samsung keyboard software, which came installed by default on some of the manufacturer's devices, is the top application found on smartphones with 40 times more installs than the next most common, which is the flashlight app. Moreover, the Samsung keyboard application has a known vulnerability. And the Samsung keyboard app is no longer being developed or supported. Now, Apple has taken steps to keep code current on the Mac platform, and it tends to warn well in advance when applications that are not, are not going to be compatible with the new versions of an operating system. That is true as well on iOS. The problem is that even though Apple runs a fairly aggressive campaign, they don't want users to feel that something has been removed from their devices. And that leads some security experts to think that Apple and the major Android platform suppliers should be more active in removing those abandoned apps. Now, Apple does allow users to set the device to offload unused apps in the settings, which can help reduce the danger of abandoned applications. But for now, users should occasionally check their mobile devices for old apps they no longer use and remove them. I know many people who have page after page after page on their home screen filled with apps. I've seen statistics that the average user has well over 100 apps on their smartphone. And you have to ask, if you're somewhere close to that average, how many of those apps do you actively use? So, Lou, I want to go to you first. This is all about mobile apps. But don't you see in your industry desktop and even serv server apps that fall into the same category that over time they're simply abandoned? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of developer and companies out there that do have actually abandoned applications. It's unfortunate that they don't take their customers seriously enough to warn them of decommissioning or sunsetting of application support. Um, some of them do do the right thing. They usually try to inform you, give you enough time to find another solution. Um, some of them just go bankrupt and belly up and you never know, um, depending on the application. 
Um, so I think it, it, it it's basically true to the fact that more things you install on in your machine, especially on a desktop, the more chance you lose sight of all those different applications and services that are running and be unaware that things might be vulnerable. And so that's why keeping machines clean are, is, is very important, especially desktops. Um, you know, you know, registries are still there and applications still stay dormant for a long time. I know I've installed applications a long time ago. Like a lot of my Adobe applications, they install these secret services. Now, gr granted, Adobe is going to be around for a while, but it doesn't mean that I don't know if a service that's got installed there is now deprecated. They no longer support it and they no longer update it. And it's just sitting there dormant, potentially a security val uh, 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 issue. So I tend to wipe my workstations every, you know, so often just to clean out all that extra garbage that's out there. Um, and I'm sure organizations do the same. They reimage machines and, and, and push out new updates. But it, it, there is a lot of that. And it's unfortunate. And again, even if they do the right thing and, and, and let their customers know that they're decommissioning or sunsetting the application or service, sometimes people don't get it. Some people don't know. Or again, these companies just tend to disappear. Well, Brian, let me ask you, with all this going on, you know, Lou mentioned regularly re-imaging systems. Is, is that the best answer? That, that seems like a way to spend a weekend on, on your device. Is re-imaging the only way to go, or are there other practices people can use to try and minimize these old abandoned apps on their systems? You know, I just don't have a good answer. You know, there's the reality is I also do the same thing. I, I don't migrate machines. I reinstall and all I move is data um, because there's so much trash left over that I, all I'm doing is I'm, I'm moving load. I'm moving stuff that I don't use. So why bother? Because there's an awful lot of stuff, you know, libraries, um, utilities, special services that are installed because, you know, I'm sorry, you know, Programmers are inherently lazy. They don't want to rewrite if something already exists. So they'll kind of piggyback on, you know, a standard utility. So those hooks, those registry entries, those, you know, whatevers are going to be there. So that's my, what I do. Um, that's also what we did in the military. We did not migrate because there's too much chance of something being left over. Now, I am going to draw an analogy, though. Um, this doesn't just happen in our industry. This happens in all kinds of places. Like I was trying to fix my uh, electric range. Um, I couldn't even buy parts for it anymore, even though it was a very common, very popular um, electric range uh, from General Electric. I couldn't buy parts. I had to search far and wide and find it. You know, it's great. And, uh, you know, it's just the way things go. You know, it's we go after the shiny and the same thing happens in the development world. But, you know, yeah, it happens. I've still got production COBOL code. Um, I'm not sure I really want to admit it, but it's still exists. I definitely have production Fortran code. Um, it got migrated over from a IBM 370 over to a uh, supercomputer, but it's still the same basic code. So I think it's something we're going to have to live with. It happens all the time. Um, I totally agree with Lou. You need to spend a little bit of time and go through. And do you really need that, you know, last version of Candy Crush? Or can you get rid of it? You know, clean up once in a while. You know, spring cleaning. Yeah. When you do spring cleaning for your house, do spring cleaning for your mobile devices. How's that sound? Well, spring cleaning sounds like the kind of adventure that we all need these days. And uh, we're going to have the opportunity to do it in real life and on our devices. Well, it's time to do some cleaning around here. Get rid of this bite and head on over to the rest of the show. Lou, we'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Curtis. Well, next up, my favorite part of the show, we get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the twi, right? But before we do, we have to another we have to actually have to thank another great sponsor of this week in enterprise tech, and that is Barracuda. Now, Barracuda is the provider of cloud-enabled enterprise-grade security solutions that protect email, networks, data, 
and applications. Think about it. Suddenly you have dozens, hundreds, or maybe even thousands of employees working remotely, each one of them getting tons of emails every day, making them vulnerable. Now, 91, 91% of all cyber attacks start in the email. Spear phishing, ransomware, account takeover, conversation hijacking. Multiply that by how many employees times how many emails. One click on the wrong email can cost you money, customers, and even your reputation. Now, Barracuda researchers have seen a steady increase in the number of coronavirus-related spear phishing attacks since January, and they've observed a recent spike of 667% in this type of attack since the end of of February. Now get the protection you need for your company with Barracuda Total Email Protection. Now it includes a lot of stuff here. All-in-one email security backup and or archiving, AI-based protection from spear phishing, account takeover, and business email compromise, and automated incident response that gives you options to quickly and efficiently address those attacks. Security awareness training is also available to educate your workforce so your employees can be first in line on defense against those attacks. Now, we've covered this a couple times on Twy, and in the current climate, bad guys are targeting people using social engineering techniques. They actually impersonate organizations like the UN World Health Organization and U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to trick users into opening malicious emails. Users access the malicious code cited, and that's it. Their devices are now attackers' machines. It's time to take back control of your security. Ensure the safety and security of your business with Barracuda. Now, to uncover the threats hiding in your inbox, get a secure, free email threat scan of your Office 365 account risk-free at barracuda.com slash enterprise. That's barracuda.com slash enterprise. Barracuda, your journey secured. And we thank Barracuda for their support of this week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's now my favorite part of the show. We get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twilight Riot. And today we have Joe Garber. He's Global Head Security, I'm sorry, Global Head Strategy and Solutions for MicroFocus. Joe, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Now, our audience loves to hear people's journey through tech. Can you maybe take us through a journey and how you found yourself at MicroFocus? I'd be happy to. Yeah, so I joined uh, MicroFocus a couple of years ago. Uh, my background goes back to Silicon Graphics, IBM, um, more recently HP, uh, and, and I, I joined HP as, as after it acquired Autonomy. I had been with Autonomy for a while. Uh, HP, as you may know, acquired Autonomy. Uh, it ran, uh, was, was involved with that organization. Uh, and then HP, as you may know, spun off its enterprise software and, and some other assets to Hewlett Packard Enterprise and uh, joined Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And then most recently, Hewlett Packard Enterprise spun off its enterprise software assets again to MicroFocus in, in 2017. So I've been with, with MicroFocus for the last couple of years and uh, the role that you described going out talking to customers and partners about uh, market trends and the intersection of technology and, and process and you know, how they digitally uh, transform their organizations and what, what they can do to take advantage of that. Right. Now, you know, we've talked a lot about here in Twilight about digital transformation. Obviously, a lot of organizations are trying to find that almost turnkey solution to help them out here. Um, can you maybe tell us a little bit more about your role um, at MicroFocus and what are the top of minds for customers when it comes to digital transformation? Yeah. Well, as I said, you know, my my role is is largely going out and talking to customers. I spent a lot of time on the road, not not recently, of course, uh, but <laughs> but over the last several years, uh, and and you know, talking about what what organizations are trying to accomplish. And I I think what I you know I, I think what I hear often is, look, there are a number of forces that are are coming to bear right now that are. Uh, forcing our hand in terms of what our, our IT strategy is. And that's, you know, some obvious things like uh, vulnerabilities, emerging vulnerab vulnerabilities, as you just talked about, uh, evolving customer needs, uh, IoT mobility, uh, the the advent or the the gaining traction of, of the cloud, obviously, over the last several years uh, as well. 
Um, and then, you know, new regulations as well. One of the things I've spent a lot of time over the last couple of years talking about is is uh, the requirements of, say, privacy regulations from GDPR. And, of course, they're, we're tracking 25, 27 different regulations around the world right now. They're, they're, you know, yet again putting additional pressure on organizations to be able to uh, manage their data, their their applications, their identities in, in new and, and, and different and, and challenging ways. Uh, and so, you know, ultimately what organizations are, are, are doing is they're, they're looking at things from, from kind of two perspectives. We talked about it, the yin and the yang. It's, it's driving the top line and managing the bottom line. And, and they're looking to leverage technology uh, to provide, you know, differentiated and compelling experiences or outcomes to be able to take advantage of the opportunities in front of them, but also to, uh, to, to manage some of the challenges that, that are being placed in front of them as well. There's always a lot of analysis, a lot of investigations, research going on. I'm always curious to hear about some of these that have to deal with digital transformation. Now, you recently did um, uh, some research with IDC on digital transformation. What did you guys get out of that? What was the analysis? Well, you know, I think the big takeaway was, look, you know, digital transformation is, is is growing in terms of spending. It was It's at about a, a third of, of all IT spending today, and the expectation is that uh, that'll go up to about 50% of all IT investment uh, going forward. So the reality is, uh, as, as we all might expect, uh, the expectations of, of IT to evolve and to digitally transform are increasing. And that, that research, by the way, was done before, or at least largely done before, a lot of the changes that we've seen happen in terms of how we work and where we work that have, we're, what we're seeing is, is, is pushing that envelope even further along the way. So, you know, the the spending in, in, in IT, specifically around digital transformation, is one, one big takeaway that we had. Uh, some others that we saw were, not surprisingly, those organizations that had prioritized uh, digital transformation had increased their revenue. They have the ability to identify new business models and, and, and new ways to engage with their customers and uh, un, underfunded parts of the business uh, all, all different areas where they're driving revenue, and as I said, growing the, the top line. Uh, not surprisingly as well, uh, those organizations that have uh, prioritized digital transformation have found better ways to engage with their customers uh, as well. Uh, so those are a couple of things. Of course, many are, are using digital transformation to drive down costs, as I said, as well. So I think those are, those are some of the big takeaways that we had from IDC. I think the other big one was as, as we looked really hard at the market and what organizations were trying to, to accomplish with digital transformation, yes, there's lots of different elements uh, to it, but fundamentally what organizations are trying to do are, are really four simple things. That's simply stated, not simple in terms of, of accomplishing them. That's to move faster, it's to have greater agility, it's to secure what's ma what matters most to the organization. I mentioned that a second ago, uh, applications, uh, data and identities. And then to uh, to to leverage uh, insights to drive value for the organization. So those are some of the big takeaways we had with IDC. And now, now kind of going on those. Obviously, there's a lot of technology out there trying to assist in this because people are trying to do, you know, hybrid data movement, compliance, all of these things. Um, what is uh, Microfocus doing to help here? Well, that's a good question. It's and the, the short answer is, is a lot. Uh, we're a company, one of the 10 largest uh, enterprise software companies in the world. We have 300 product lines. Uh, so we have the luxury of delivering you know, really a holistic set of solutions for, for organizations. And, and the way we've organized our solutions and the way we prioritize the investments within them, uh, you know, whether that's R&D or M&A or go to market, has really been around the, the, the four elements I talked about. So driving speed, which is really akin to enterprise DevOps, uh, de delivering a greater agility, which is really around hybrid IT management. Uh, it's providing security and, and again, through security risk and, and, and governance, uh, you know, compliance obviously fits into there as well. And then providing insights with uh, with our predictive analytics solutions. And, and and the reality is, you know, organizations don't come to us typically, and at least right away, and say, I need all of those things right away. Uh, often what we see is, is organizations come to us with a specific problem. Uh, they, they've, they've been through the you know, some of the challenges of the past of, look, I've, you know, I, I put a platform in and I tried to do boil the ocean approach to it and we didn't get the value out of it that we, that we needed to. So often what, and it, with that experience in the back of their mind, 
often what we hear from them is, look, you know, help us start with one problem. You know, whether it's it's one challenge within, say, security risk and governance or within one department or one geography, solve that problem, uh, build out the ROI on that. And then over time, we'll, we'll continue to build within that particular area or across the, the, the different elements to ultimately digitally transform as an organization. Right. Well, I do want to bring my co-host back in. Uh, let's start with you first, Curtis. Curtis? You know, you're talking about digital transformation and, and IDC. I spent a lot of years working at IDG, which is IDC's corporate sibling. So I, I know the IDC language and, and many of their analysts. But I've also been going to Gartner, uh, the Gartner Symposium, for years. And so I hear their language. And you hit the digitalization and 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 all of these things you you get lots of different words around the concept of basically using IT to bring more value to the business are there profound differences in all of these terms that we're using or are are we really just fighting the battle over different analysis groups trying to put their own stamp on the same set of ideas well, it, it depends, uh, is the short answer. And I've been to lots of those symposiums as well, and, and there are certainly unique elements in each particular case. But fundamentally, you know, as I, as I talked about, you know, what we see, whether we go to IDC or Gartner or Forrester or any of the other analyst firms, is, is that organizations are trying to accomplish those, those elements that I talked about. It's, it's speed, agility, security, and, and insights. Uh, and, and I would I would say it's not just to, to drive value, it's, though that's certainly a big part of it. But again, you know, you look at things like RPA and uh, being able to deliver applications faster at, at, at lower risk and lower cost. Uh, there's obviously a, a, a you know, again, again, there's a yin and yang or a, a cost element uh, that, that are, people are taking into account as well. OK, so we're, we're, we're talking about this transformation that's going to be happening, this this path that a company is going to want to walk along. There are obviously many facets to that. You know, we, we often talk about the, the triad of people, process, technology, all of that. So if, if you're going to, to look at this, let's, let's say you're one of the handful of companies that has yet to start on this whole process. Do you, do you look at, at the, the culture and, and the processes of the company and then get the IT to support that? Do, do you start with bringing in new IT systems and change your culture to wrap around them, uh, a la what was happening around SAP in the 90s? Um, or, or do the two things have to happen at the same time? How, how do you make this digital transformation if, if you're starting from scratch? Well, it, I, I think that's an important place to start is many organizations don't have to start from scratch. Uh, they can, you know, and so we talk often about uh, the, the desire to, you know, one, often customers will come to us and say, look, you know, we want to rip and replace and start over from scratch. And, and that's a, a, a place to start. Uh, but, and, and of course, that the benefits of ripping and replacing and starting from scratch are that you get all new technology and all new processes and, uh, and have the ability to hit the, the reset button. But what we found is that Many organizations, most organizations, you know, certainly any any of that have been around for any period of time, have have developed over time, and they have core business systems. It, COBOL was mentioned earlier, and I'm very familiar with that. That's that's one of the the technologies we support here and have for you know for almost uh, forty the forty plus years of our existence. And of course, the, the technology is even older than that. Um, but it, there there are these business these systems of record that organize and and by the way, IP and processes that have been built up around those core business systems that uh, that are delivering real value to you as an organization. So you know, start starting completely from scratch doesn't always make the most amount of sense. Often what we suggest to our customers is you know, take a modernization approach. Uh, identify what your core needs are, where the real value is coming. Obviously, look downstream at what you want to accomplish over time, but um, you know, start with it and modernize bridging, you know, the by bridging the existing and the emerging, 
uh, your technology so you can digitally transform. So we often talk about is running and transforming at the same time. And that's what, what we're seeing a lot more organizations wanting to do is, is that. So they, not all of them are, are, are starting from scratch. That said, you're, you're, to answer your, your initial question, um, you know, what, what matters most? Um, obviously, vision uh, is one of the things that really matters. I, I, I just saw a fact recently, not from IDC, but from another organization that today, 85% of, of digital transformations fail. And, and I think there's one fundamental reason for that, and that is because of the culture, because many organizations don't, haven't adopted the risk-taking kind of um, mentality, uh, the fail fast kind of, of thought process, and, and haven't approached digital transformation the right way and then sort of a, uh, a methodical, pragmatic process, as I just described. Uh, so I think that culture is really a, a core part of really, uh, culture and then a commitment over time because digital transformation doesn't happen uh, overnight. It's, it's often an a, a, a multiple set of initiatives that take place over time. So you need to have the buy-in from your, organi your, your top executives to be able to manage that over time. All right. So I'd like to kind of follow up on that answer. You know, when we start talking about best practices and things like that, I, my personal opinion is one of the best practices is actually a psychological approach to how you do a, a transformation in any type of organization. Do you have some tips and tricks on best practices on how to deal with the old folks, the older folks, the people that have been there for a long time that are also the most mirrored in the mud on and don't want to transform? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Uh, the answer is yes, we, we do. And, and it varies, of course, from, from organization to organization, but, but often, the one of the first and most important things to do is, is to bring them in and have, have them be part of the process, uh, provide their input early on, because not only does that get sort of an implied buy in from them, but but oftentimes you find out from from the the old guard, if you will, that uh, so some of the skeletons in the closet, things that will break if, if you if you evolve them too fast too, uh, and, and too much or alternatively, where things are really providing value to you as an organization that you, you simply don't want to, to break. So I think that's, that's one of the big parts there is, is you know, bring them in early. Uh, the second one that, that we've seen often is, is you know, and it, it seems sort of self-evident, but I've seen it not work you know, in, with some frequency, and that is to, to share the vision. What is it you're trying to accomplish? Not, not just one year out, but five years out, 10 years out, and, and then ladder up what they're doing to, those vi to that vision over a period of time, because it, people need to, to understand what they're trying to accomplish, what the organization's trying to accomplish to be able to evolve over time. And then, of course, you know, a significant amount of it is, 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 is communicating early and often making sure that you're touching base with people, explaining where things have changed, because invariably, the, the, you know, probably not all of it, but a significant amount of the strategy you put in place in year one might evolve in years two and three, and, and that might create additional confusion, which to some people might mean that things, things have broken down and they throw their hands up and say, wow, wow this, this isn't working, when in fact, it's just evolve the the playing field is, is evolving a little bit. So I think the, those the, the three of those things really are very important when you're when you're managing any kind of change. Uh, digital transformation, of course, being one of those. All right now, a lot of a lot of organizations they tend to either want to get all the spirit systems, all systems up into the cloud, get get that all transformed right away. Some of them want to take more incremental approach. Now, Curtis, you know, a lot of a lot of organizations they try to be agile. And they try to fail fast, like uh, like the, we've been talking about. But is that the best model for everybody? Is there more of a gradual model for some organizations? Well, I think that you still have a lot of organizations that do decide that they're going to stay with their traditional development methods. And I, I think that's something that that I would love to hear from from Joe is is the move to digital transformation, something that must be accomplished within an agile framework, or are there other organizational methods that can be used and, and be equally successful? 
Well, you know, again, it's a, it, it depends. Answer it depends on the organization. Depends what the objectives are and, and so forth. We're we're seeing a a significant move towards towards DevOps, and uh, and and so that's that's a big part of of uh, you know where we're putting our investments today. So yes, I would say more often than not, you're seeing that move to agile, move to DevOps is is being a significant part. Is that is that a requirement in every single case? No, of course it's not. Um, just like you know is 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 moving to the cloud. You know, we, we have customers that will come to us from time to time and say, got to move to the cloud. And often they don't mean I need to move everything to the cloud, though it's stated that way from time to time. And what they what they really mean is they need to come up with a strategy whereby they can get some additional agility by moving some information to the cloud. And and there are other the, there are other elements that need to come into play there as well. And and that's being exacerbated by some of the the changes we're seeing today with with the pandemic and such, uh, where, whereby there there are new vulnerabilities that are that are being picked up today as people are moving things to the cloud. So there's there there are there are considerations that need to take place uh, even as they're as they're making some of these adjustments. Joe, I've got a follow up, and this kind of goes around. We've had lots and lots of guests talking about AI and machine learning. Mm -hmm. And how big an impact? Is this a flash in the pan or is this really going to be a big uh, paradigm shift in the way we do business? Well, I want to, my personal belief is that it is a significant, it is of significant importance. And to, to, to virtually any organization, regardless of whether you're trying to drive the top line or again, manage the bottom line. Uh, you see AI and machine learning being applied to boosting and sustaining revenue with data mining. Obviously, that, that's the obvious example or driving customer engagement with chatbots or delivering a greater speed as we talked about with things like smarter functional testing or cognitive search. And then, you know, again, you have the bottom line improving quality and delivery with things like AI ops and streamlining and uh, enhancing processes like like with RPA, and then even being applied to things like detecting risk uh, with user behavior analytics as an example of that, or applying it to physical security. We have a, a customer uh, in in uh, Asia Pacific that um, it, it's it's a big uh, big city that leverages artificial intelligence to triangulate a number of different things as an example. So. Um, you know what's happening with CCTV and what's happening on social media and what they're seeing, uh, you know, elsewhere in terms of facial recognition, and they're pulling all of those things together to help manage risk. So you're you're seeing AI and machine learning come into many different elements of uh, of digital transformation, and I, I think it's here to stay. And I'll, I'll tell you, I, you know, I cut my teeth in eDiscovery uh, many years ago, so that's that's effectively search for legal purposes. And, and you know, that's, that's an area where there was initial resistance to AI and machine learning. Uh, it was called technology assisted review or predictive analytics at the time, at least within that environment. And, um, and, and there, were, there were so many concerns and questions about what if I get this wrong? What, if, what, what is the efficacy rate of, of uh, leveraging you know, AI and machine learning? Uh, but but over time, obviously that technology has gotten better. People have understood the technology more, and now of course we're seeing it, you know, being applied to many different types of technologies uh, that that aren't in, in the traditional sort of big data sense, if you will. Uh, I can tell you that we at Microfocus have some really strong technology and uh, Vertica and Idle, and we're we're going out of our way to make sure that we're integrating those technologies into our DevOps, our hybrid IT, our our security risk and governance solutions, because we see that as being a, a, a you know a wave of the future. Joe, thank you so much for being here. We're running a little bit low on time. I did want to give you a chance maybe to tell the folks at home where organizations to go to learn more about digital transformation and more about what Microfocus has to offer. Yeah, happy to. Well, you know, I think starting off with, you know, where do you go to learn more information about digital transformation? I think you, you go and you talk to your peers. There are plenty of great uh, LinkedIn sites. There are a number of different uh, places, places like this where you can learn more about it, of course. Um, there are many uh, industry analysts we've talked about that have provided some great information around digital transformation with, with, with many of the different analyst firms we've already mentioned. 
uh, I would mention you're, you're picturing here. Uh, we just launched a microsite around digital transformation uh, that you can reach at microfocus.com slash DX, DX for course for digital transformation, where you can see a lot of the information we've talked about from IDC, uh, from other thought leaders and some of our product experts to learn more about what digital transformation is and how it can be useful to you as an organization. Thank you again. Well, folks, you've done it again. You've sat through another hour of the best thing enterprise podcast in the universe. So keep up with your IT news by listening to us while you wait for your Uber Eats. But I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to my co-host, of course, starting with our very own Mr. Brian Chi. Chibert, what's going on with you in this coming week and where can people find you and get in touch with you? I am packing and packing <laughs> and packing. <laughs> And actually, I'm also doing inventory because when you move across the country, I'm I'm going to be moving across the ocean and across the country. Uh, I think I ought to insure my stuff, and I'm cringing to see how much the underwriter is going to charge me. Woohoo! But I would love to hear from the Twilight Riot. I am A D V N E T L A B on Twitter, so Advanced Net Lab. I am also Chebert, spelled C H E E B E R T at twit.tv. But better yet, why don't you hit twiet at twit.tv and that will hit all the hosts. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear your show ideas. Um, I actually really don't mind if you hate what we what we did. You know, we had some fans say we really hated this segment and uh, we had a very nice discussion. It was very professional. Um, don't mind it. Uh, criticism is actually a really good way of making sure everything improves. So we'd like to hear from you. Um, also, to, you know, Lou's going to tell it again, but the Twit community is a, another great place for a open forum. So we'd love to hear from you folks. Stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you, Jeebert. Well, we also have to thank our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin, Senior Editor at Dark Reading. Curtis, what's going on for you in the coming week? Where can people find you and your work? Well, as always, people can find my writing over at Dark Reading and at the edge of Dark Reading. I uh, just had a piece up on a rogues gallery of macOS malware and uh, also been doing some 101s, explaining things like what is SQL injection? What is cross-site scripting? And I've got more of those come. I'm also working on a piece on what a new normal might look like for cybersecurity if we got to choose what that new normal was going to look like. If you've got some ideas on that, uh, feel free to hit me up on my Twitter feed down there at KG4GWA. Uh, let me know what you think. I think it might be fascinating to know what cybersecurity would look like if we didn't have all of the legacy stuff to deal with, if, if we could design it ourselves. Thank you, Curtis. Well, folks, we also have to thank you as well. You're the person who drops in each and every week to get, to get your enterprise goodness and watch and listen to our show we want to make it easy for you to watch and listen. So go right now to catch up on your enterprise news by going to our show page, twit.tv slash twiet. There you'll find all of the amazing back episodes, the show notes, the co-host information, guest information, even the links of the stories that we're doing in the show. But more importantly, next to those videos there, you'll get those helpful subscribe and download links. Support the show by getting the audio version, the video version, the HD video version of your choice. And listen on any one of your devices because we're on, on every one of those podcast applications on and on YouTube as well. So check that out. It's the best way to stay on top of your enterprise news. So go ahead and subscribe. But after you subscribe, impress your friends, your family, your coworkers, share the gift of Twiat because they'll definitely be impressed and they'll get their enterprise and IT news for that week. And if you're already subscribed and you're available during the day, like right now around 1.30 p.m. Pacific on Friday, we do the show live, live.twit.tv each and every week. Come see how the show is run. Come see how the pizza is made. Come see behind the scenes. We love doing this show. and We have a lot of fun, a lot of banter. So come check that out. But if you're going to watch the show live, you might as well jump into the chat room live as well. We have a great chat room here, irc.twit.tv. They have a great set of characters. We have some great content that comes out of there. So definitely come and jump into that well as well if you're going to watch the show live. But like Cheaper said, you can't be part of the show live. 
you subscribe, you're listening, but you also want to be part of the conversation, we have a great community. It's a great website out there, twit.community. It's a great website. Come join 24-7 discussion. All the community is out there. We have co-hosts out there. We have the show. Uh, some of the Sometimes the guests jump out there. We have a lot of technology discussions, a lot of discussions. Some people actually ask questions on how to get started. We actually help them and work them uh, walk, work through some solutions for them. So definitely check that out, twit.community. It's a great place to be. It's a great place to be part of the discussion 24 7 remember you can always follow me twitter.com slash lou mm there i post all of my enterprise tidbits plus i get to have great conversations with people like you of course and and also i post what i do during my normal work week at microsoft if you want to learn more about that you can always go to developer.microsoft.com slash office we have some re- really great ways to customize your office solutions to make it more productive for you as well. I want to thank everyone who makes the show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa. They, Lisa, they continue to support us each and every week to support, and they support us doing this week at Enterprise Tech, and we just we couldn't do it without them. So thank you for all their support. I also want to thank all the engineers at Twit. And of course, we have to thank Mr. Brian G one more time because he's not only our our co-host, but he's also our tireless producer as well. He does all the show bookings. He does all the show notes. He does. He talks to the to the PR people. He gets all the guests on. We just really couldn't do the show without him. So thank you again, Cheaper, for all your work, especially during your your move time. We appreciate that. Thank you, sir. And before we sign out, we have to thank our TD for today, Jeff. Jeff, are you? Uh, how's things going over there, Twitty? Are you still the lone man in the studio? I'm still the lone man here. We do. We're starting to bring a couple people back, keeping them at great distances. So our controller is here doing some work today. And uh, Anthony will be here later for the Twit After Hours show. Uh, so that's going to be real awesome. And that was a good show today, guys. So really appreciate it. Yeah, we, we have a great show and we always have great guests. So well, thank you for support. We appreciate it, Jeff. You're very welcome. Take, take care. And until next time, I'm Louis Moresca, just reminding you, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise... Just keep quiet. Hi, I'm Jason Howell, host of All About Android, where each week I'm joined by Ron Richards, Florence Ion, and a rotating crew of Android journalists, developers, and enthusiasts, where we talk about the latest news, hardware, and apps for the Android faithful. You can subscribe by going to twit.tv AAA or find the show in your podcatcher of choice. That's All About Android.